Hello. Good to see everyone. How was everyone doing tonight? Front, front row's gone. Oh, yeah, that's all I like here. Everyone's yelling, going crazy. All right, cool. We have a special night. This is the last shine forever. No, I'm not. Just joking, just joking, just joking. This is not the last shine forever. This is the last shine just for the year because they're, um, they're having some plays and stuff here in the main sanctuary. So instead of putting one in the middle and everyone getting lost and no one showing up, we just close it down for the rest of the year. But starting up January 8th, right? Yeah. January 8th. January, so you guys even know better than me. January 8th is going to be the first one. Uh, we'll start it up for the new year. And uh, we're starting Shine in uh, Diamond Bar on Sunday nights. So there'll be two Shines, two different areas. So uh, it's just expanding. And uh, our radio show will be launching the first week of February. And uh, yeah, we're stoked on that. <laughs> Um, God opened the door for it to uh, actually be on K-Wave and KKLA exactly at the same time live. So it will be a Southern California takeover. So we are stoked. That's never been done before. That's never been done before, just so you guys know. God's hooking it up. Um, so that's that. But um, I brought these out because I'm stoked on these products. And I never come out and, and show you products, but I got to show you these ones, okay? So the first one is the, uh, the onesie baby. The glory t-shirt. So we have them in all three sizes. I don't have a baby, so I don't know, but you know the sizes. I'm sure it has to do with months. This is for a baby that's, um, I found out I'm 586 months. That's how old I am. In case anyone's wondering how old I am. Me and Chris were laughing about that the day you talked to them. How old's your baby? They're like uh, 85 months. I'm like, isn't that like seven years old, eight years old? <laughs> then... We got the girls onesie. All right, all right, all right. All right. Then we got the tie-dye. The tie-dye, my favorite tie-dye. So there's other stuff, but this is the cool, fun stuff, and we're going to do a lot more of the cool, fun stuff. So um, that's that. So uh, tonight, what we're going to do, we have a very special guest, one of, um, one of our friends. Uh, he, uh, he works here at Calvary Chapel. He, um, he trains the church boys over here, the wrestling team. They're, they're, he'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but they're some of the gnarliest guys. And uh, what do you mean? Oh, you grab it. Stealing. Thou shalt not steal um, or covet. Uh, and now he actually, while he trains the kids here at the school, he also trains some of the biggest UFC fighters. So um, we're going to play a video to, to intro him, and then we're going to come out and have a conversation, cool? All right, here we go. This is the Calvary Chapel Wrestling Retreat. It's an annual event that we bring the kids up to to get kind of focused on their goals for the year and also just focused on things of the Lord and uh, kind of the definitive principles of Church Boys Wrestling. Today we'll be doing a workout that involves carrying a rock around for close to three hours. This rock symbolizes sin. It's after a devotion that we have in Hebrews chapter 12. Chapter 12 starts off and it says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us cast off the weight of sin that so easily ensnares us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. As Christ is the example and what he did for us on the cross and how he took our sin and bore our sin and was crucified on the cross that we would be purged clean of sin. In the same way, these boys are gonna carry this rock and it's gonna symbolize like the weight of sin. You know, that sin could be any number of things, you know. Teenage boys are getting themselves into all kinds of stuff. I wish someone would have did this workout with me because I went off the rails in college. I was carrying all kinds of sin. I was carrying all kinds of weight and trying to live and trying to function and trying to just do anything with this sin and heaviness and regret that comes along with a, you know, a poor lifestyle. I want this lesson to be really clear to these kids because they're all getting ready to go off to college. And, uh, you know, they're going to make mistakes and there's things that are going to happen or whatever, and I want them to recognize, man, 
I remember how miserable that rock workout is, and I don't want a life of a rock workout. I don't want that in my life for the rest of my life. I'm gonna change. And uh, there's a point in the workout where, you know, we ask them, because they all know. They all know the story of the workout and what it's about. And uh, it's right before they drop the rock. So what does this rock symbolize? They say, it's sin. Are you ready to let go of this sin? Are you ready to, ready to drop this rock? And, uh, you know, get out from underneath the weight of it? I said, yeah. This is just a, an object lesson that, you know, maybe it's just planting a seed for the future. Because uh, there'll be a time when they'll may maybe be hitting bottom and they'll remember, man, all I got to do is drop this rock <laughs> and, and give it to God and ask God to, you know, give me a fresh start. I want them to know that when they compromise themselves or when they disrespect themselves, it's going to incur damage and it's going to cost them peace. It's going to cost them confidence. It's going to cost them you know, assurance of themselves and all those things that just erode you from the inside out when you live like a compromised life. And uh, I want them to understand like how weak they become, how tiring it is, and just the drudgery of living like that day in and day out. I want them to think back to this and go, man, I don't want to be under this. And in this workout, they'll understand. All I got to do is turn to, turn to Jesus. You know, that's, that's as, as easy as it was for me. It took me going to prison and, and, you know, doing a little stretch in prison from just having all this rage and anger and, and all this stuff. And uh, I don't want any of these kids to go through that. That's my sole reason to coach is to help them avoid this, you know. Wrestling is great and all that. It's a game. It's just a game. We teach them how to be good at a game. But the true fact of why I'm here as a coach is I, I, I want them to avoid these mistakes that I made. I want them to avoid the heartbrokenness that I have. And I want them to know that they can be free in Jesus. They can be free when they you know, look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of their faith. And they can just give all their cares to him, all their concerns, all their woes. And he will carry that weight. And he'll make them weightless. And they can just walk upright, chest out, proud, strong, and know that they're God's kids. And, and he loves them and he's there to help them. Here we go, here we go. We're gonna get the chairs up here and uh, welcome Coach Jake. I gotta get my questions ready. What'd you guys think of the video? All right, Coach Jake, Yo. tell me a little bit about your first encounter at church and in church culture. Oh, okay. Um, I think for me, my introduction to church was a little skewed, I would say. Um, you know, church was kind of a thing that our family did on Sundays, you know, and Wednesdays and stuff like that. My dad was a deacon at this church. It's really like... Pentecostal four square church, you know, a lot of yelling and screaming and dancing around and tambourines and all that type of stuff. And I was just like, whoa, this is weird, you know. And then, um, you know, it wasn't always like this, but it got more and more frequent like this. Here's my dad raising his hands in worship, crying, praise the Lord, and all this and that. And then on the way home, like clockwork, stop by the liquor store, case of beer partying throughout the day, just sitting on the couch, watching football games or whatever, and by the afternoon, just hammered. Same guy that I saw a couple hours before saying, oh, God bless you, praise the Lord, and all this Christianese talk to everybody in the halls of church, and now he's just not only wasted, but cussing me out and telling me you're stupid and I wish I would have had an abortion instead of having you and you're probably some other some other sailor's baby. There's no way something as retarded as you came out of me, blah, blah, blah. It was bad. And, uh, you know, he got physical with me, put me in the hospital seven different times when I was growing up, and saw all this different stuff. So it's hard for me to think of this guy or this place filled with people like this guy and like God and church and worship and 
I was just like, this is all just something that all these people do to make themselves feel good about themselves. Bunch of hypocrites and it's garbage. And so for me, church was just a place that we went on Sundays and Wednesdays. Didn't really mean anything to me. And in fact, I kind of like looked at it and was like, keep your eye on these people. I don't trust them, you know? That's how my orientation to Christianity and church culture was in the beginning. It's very, it's confusing though, because when you, when you do actually try and follow God, you know, he says that you, uh, trans, it, he transforms your mind and your heart and old things pass away and all things become new. But then you see this kind of stuff that's happening in the church with people. It's like, it's confusing. And that's why people that aren't Christians, like the Christians go, these guys are clowns. Yeah. Like they're going to church saying one thing and then they're going out and doing all this other stuff. So it's, it is very confusing. Yeah. So how, um, what were some of, the, some of the ways you escaped this abu- abusive environment? For me, I just kind of hid my life in sports. I started off playing Pop Warner football, like third grade. Um, and then I met some friends from there that were into wrestling. And that kind of introduced me to wrestling. I was like, wrestling? And I imagine like wearing little leopard Speedos and jumping off the ropes and hitting people in the head with your elbow and swinging them around and hitting them with a chair. And I'm like, they have that in high school? Like, you can do that? <laughs> I didn't know what it was, you know? And they just pointed to this building that was, like, far away, had no windows. It was just, like, this little cube out in the middle of the parking lot. And in my mind, I'm, like, imagining ropes and ding, ding, ding. You know? I'm like, that's weird. I didn't know they do that here. And then I went and saw, and I was like, ah, oh, this is pretty cool. You guys are just beating each other up for two hours, and they're not getting in trouble. It's like, it's okay. All right, I'll try this, you know? And... And so I just, you know, once I discovered wrestling and the craft of wrestling, because it really is super technical, there's a lot of like moves and things you gotta study and all this type of stuff, it's like became addicting. And I just hid my life in that and uh, ended up connecting with a coach who was actually the first coach here, a guy named John Azevedo. And I just followed him around like a puppy dog and everywhere that he was coaching at, I was just like his little Padawan learner, just studying him, you know? I think one of the most important things that I did learn from him was the love of Christ. Uh, He just loved me. You know, he was gracious towards me. He always spoke the scriptures into my life. He always, you know, prayed for me. He always was immediate to take any concern to the Lord. And the way that this guy did Christianity and his walk with Jesus, it was so different than what I was used to when I was younger. And so it kind of taught me, in my opinion, like the right way or the real way to walk with God and live life or whatever. And so he gave me the first snapshot of like what that looks like. <clears throat> yeah, well, when you were in school, did, were you involved with any kind of uh, cra- crazy stuff at school or were you just really focused on like drugs and alcohol and stuff like that or was it just in, mainly wrestling? In high school... It was mainly wrestling. My dream was to get a big scholarship to, you know, a big college and go off and win national titles and all this type of stuff. And that's really all I cared about. And I thought, like, the druggy people and drunks and stuff like that, I didn't want to drink or anything like that because I just saw my dad. I was like, I don't want to be like that guy. And then I saw people that, you know, sat around and did drugs, and I was like, they're nothing like me. Like, that's not me. You know, I'm a... I guess, an athlete or whatever, you know, and so I just stayed that way, you know. I think the disillusionment really began for me when I went off to college. I ended up wrestling out at Arizona State University. Uh, It was the toughest university on the Western United States, and uh, they're just, on, on the Western United States, they were the only school that was like, okay, this is a competitive wrestling school, and uh, all the guys on their lineups are like heroes of you know, high school wrestling and college wrestling and stuff like that. And I think the first time I kind of got turned a little sideways was we're at some off season like backyard party or whatever and they're like drinking beer and this and that and that wasn't like so shocking to me. But then like doing drugs and all of this type of stuff and then like the pipe comes to me and here's all these people that I looked up to even maybe had posters on my wall of them and they're like, here. And I'm like, oh, uh, okay. Like, I don't want to be dorky, you know? And it wasn't like that was the first time I ever smoked pot. 
I had once when I was, you know, smaller, but like that was the first time it was like, hey, we're all of us here. And, you know, it just sounds so stupid. I feel dumb to even say it, but it's totally like the peer pressure thing, you know? And I was like, all right, okay. I did it. <laughs> all right, go away. Leave me alone. You know what I mean? That's how it all started. And then all of a sudden, it was like, this is kind of fun. And all of a sudden, I started ending up with the pipe in my pocket. Or all of a sudden, it's like I end up with a bag. Or all of a sudden, I would get a bag. And then all of a sudden, it's like, hey, call Jake, because I was a bouncer at a nightclub out in uh, Arizona. Oh, he knows people. He can, he can get a bag. And all of a sudden, over time, I turned into like that guy for the team, which is pretty heartbreaking. I hate to even admit it, but I would be the guy that they would call whenever they would want to score, and I would find whatever what was needed. And that pretty much framed the back end of my college experience. Um, I didn't achieve the goals and dreams and things that I went there to do and set out to do. And as I realized that that wasn't going to happen, and I still had like a year left or whatever, I just kind of went more and more into the lifestyle of like gnarliness, <laughs> you know, just the whole working in a night nightclub. Um, my degree field was photography, and at the time, you know, in the mid '90s and stuff like that, the rave scene just totally exploded in the Arizona desert, and so there's like huge desert parties all the time. 60,000 people out in the middle of nowhere just raging or whatever and shooting pictures and partying with all these people or whatever. And within a very short amount of time, I basically developed a habit to where I was passing out almost every single day from either drinking myself to sleep or smoking and passing out or straight just partying, putting all kinds of different stuff up my nose and it was, it was bad, real bad. How'd you, um, so what, what, was, uh, what was the point when you actually had that switch over when you found God after living like this? Well, um, as I s said, it just kind of got exponentially worse and worse, but I masked myself so much with all of my, like, uh, I don't know, I just, I, th I thought I was two different people. I thought like, here's the Jake that goes out and parties and all this and that, but then here's the Jake that's successful in photography and doing well and all this and that. And so if I ever was seeing that I was doing bad, I would just think, oh no, I did this. I just had this published in this magazine and I did this or whatever. I never felt like the guilt of it, you know? And I think it all caught up with me. I was out shooting this trade show in Las Vegas called The Magic Show, where they come out with all the new clothes and all that stuff. and. Uh, you know, I, I was shooting at the show the first day, and then in the evening, you know, at the magic show, a lot of politicking happens on the floor of the conference, but the big moves happen, like, in the nightclubs and the VIP lounges and stuff like that. And, and I was at this event, you know, sponsored by, I forget what clothing company, but, you know, it's so funny because all these names are all, like, super old names, but, like, Snoop. Uh, Lauren Hill, Nas, and all these people are performing. Kid Capri was spinning. Uh, a group called the Alcoholics was, you know, rapping. I mean, it's just whatever. It was just, it was just this, the scene, you know. And I'm shooting in there, shot the whole event, and then went up to the VIP lounge. People were buying me drinks and this and that. I don't really remember much. Um, the next day, I woke up in the suite of the company that hired me to go out there. I got torn clothes, dirt all messed up, like, man, what happened, you know? And I'm checking my knuckles, did I get in a fight again? Like, what's going on? I don't even really remember. I like wake up and I'm starting to walk towards the mirror to like get a look at myself to see if I'm cut up or anything. I totally feel sore, but it's not abnormal. Like I would wake up like this all the time at Arizona State. We would beat somebody up, I wouldn't even remember. I'd be walking around campus knowing that we fought somebody, but I don't even remember the guy's face. And just like, I hope, I don't get snuck right now and just get stolen out of the side of my head because that was the guy that we beat up at the bar or whatever, you know. Anyways, <clears throat> so I go to the mirror. On my way to the mirror, I see myself and uh, the owner of the company comes in from the other suite and he sits down and he's like, dude, are you all right? How you feeling? I'm trying to play it off. Oh, I'm fine. Everything's great. Yeah, give me a water. I'm good. Whew, when are we going to the next thing or whatever? You know, he's like, you know, I think, I think we're done. I think, I think you need to just mellow out here and stay here. 
apparently I was like passed out on the floor of the VIP lounge wearing all the company's clothes, uh, looking like a total idiot and like big time people are like stepping over me to get to the bar. I just looked, I did a bad thing for that company. Yes. You know, disservice. And so they fired me from that, that gig right there, but I was booked to stay there for the whole week. So they said I could stay or call someone to come pick me up or whatever. <clears throat> really long story short, uh, I get some brilliant idea that day to write up some contract and sell all my images to the first nightclub owner and try to compensate my week's worth of work and then I was gonna go back home. My girlfriend would come and pick me up and I would just go back home. And so I'm starting to drive around Vegas. Oh, I'm sorry. So he fired me from the gig. The whole crew left the two suites. And I'm sitting there by myself just going, what am I gonna do? And uh, as I'm like trying to put together the pieces of the, uh, what happened the night before, I'm going through all my stuff, all the pockets of my pants and all these different things and uh, see all these business cards of all these handshakes that I shook hands with, big time people, photo editor of this, you know, CEO of this company, all these companies I always wanted to work with. I started laying all the business cards out edge to edge all over my bed or the bed in the hotel. Queen size bed, like 80% filled up with business cards edge to edge. And I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, man, I've arrived, I've made it. It's a you know pro photographer, and then I think every handshake was probably like <laughs> just wasteoid, and I was like, dude, I've arrived and destroyed my career all in the same night. I gotta stop. I gotta stop drinking. I gotta stop snorting coke. I gotta you know stop smoking weed. I need to stop. I need to stop. I can stop. I'm a wrestler. I'm tough. I've cut weight before. I can do anything. Quit cold turkey. That was like on a Monday. Wednesday comes around and I, I can't even sleep. Like Monday night comes around and I'm so used to being drunk by you know, 4 or 5 p.m. that like I'm, I'm feeling weird. Like you know, I won't have a beer, I won't smoke, I won't anything. No, I'm stopping all this stuff, whatever. My stomach's starting to feel weird, like ripping. My arms feel all itchy, I'm, I'm just feeling aggravated, you know. They come in like at four in the morning. I'm just up like it's noon. They all go to sleep. I'm just up. I watch the sun come up from the window. They're all getting ready to go back to the trade show. I'm just up. I already called my girlfriend. She can't come out until like Wednesday or something like that. Um, it was just a drag. Wednesday morning, again, I haven't slept and now it's like close to 72 hours of like no sleep. Girlfriend shows up, she takes a nap, and I get the brilliant idea to take my car and drive around and write up this contract to go and you know, sell the images to the club owner. So uh, I, I, get the, uh, I get the rolls of film, I go to the club owner, I show him my portfolio and all this stuff, and he's like, interesting concept, um, why don't you go and you know, get a contract written up and then we'll talk about, uh, you know, selling these images or whatever. I was gonna sell them like eight rolls of film for like two grand or something like that. And so uh, I'm driving around looking for a Kinko's to write up this contract. This is where things go real bad. 72 hours, no sleep. I'm starting to hear things. I think people are after me. I'm totally tripping out. I'm driving around Las Vegas and I'm like sure that like this car is following me. These people are following me. Who are these people? And, uh, I saw them like so many turns ago or this or that or whatever. I'm driving on the freeway, probably going, you know, 80 miles per hour or whatever. And I look over and I'm sure that it's the same cars following me. Long story short, I smash this car off the freeway, smash another car, wreck another car, get off the freeway. A guy won't turn left. I smash him, you know, whatever. 25, 30 minutes later, Six assault with a deadly weapon charges, because when you intentionally drive your car into another person, it's a deadly weapon. Six assault with a deadly weapon charges, two hit and run and fleeing the scene, and then five, like, malicious destruction of property, because when I finally hit, like, the island and snapped my axle and I couldn't drive my car anymore, like, I ran out, freaking out, like, 
smashed a windshield with my fist, put my head through another person's windshield, all this crazy stuff. I'm thinking, these people are trying to kill me. They're after me. I don't know. I messed up. So I run to this, like, Vaughn's Pavilions or whatever. Help, help, these people are trying to kill me. Ah." It's like 5 in the afternoon. There's, like, moms holding their baby. Beep, beep. Like, (laughs) who's this weird guy that just, like, ran in? I'm bleeding. I'm shirt's torn. (laughs) I look like I just jumped out of the jungle or something, you know? And, like, literally I'm watching, and there's, like, this lucid, quiet moment that felt like an hour. And then like this wave of bodies just like pick me up, slam me down the ground, start beating me up. People, I think there was some security guards in there. I know the police report said there's off-duty cops in there. People are seeing me run people down, like vigilante, helpful people. Dude, I got rolled up pretty bad. I don't remember what happened. I woke up in the ambulance. I had like a towel over my face. I had like some neck cuff, <laughs> arm cuffs. I guess I was biting at everyone, spitting at everyone or whatever. Went to jail, uh, was there for like a couple weeks, got processed, and then my parents posted bail, and I came out and uh, started to, it's actually pretty interesting. After they posted bail and I came out, uh, my dad, who I don't get along with, he comes in my room all wringing his hands, begging me not to like run to Mexico to try to beat this potential prison sentence that I'm going to have. And uh, there's a family that has known me from the church that I grew up in since I was a little kid. Uh, They said, we don't understand what has happened, but we love you. And we just want you to come with us to church. And I didn't want to go with them. I thought church was garbage. I thought I was filled with a bunch of hypocrites and just some silly thing, like I told you before. But this guy was super helpful like with all of my training when I was younger, he'd sponsor to send me to the nationals and all this and that. I didn't feel that I could disrespect him and be like, forget I'm not going to church. So I went in it with the worst attitude, just like, what's this gonna do for me? I'm going to prison for the rest of my life. What's church gonna do for me? And it ended up taking me to this church, uh, Calvary Chapel Golden Springs. And we're on the way out there and driving up. I see the guy at the door tatted out guy, big old smile. Hey, how's it going, brother? <laughs> Fine, whatever. Yeah, you know, just bad attitude. This is my dad's church, in case you guys don't know. Yeah, <laughs> well, it, it, his dad's church is awesome. And, uh, but I didn't know it. It was a t- total sneak attack by this family that yeah, asked yeah. for me to go because I was just like, <laughs> and then I get there, and I mean, it's, it's, you know, what was it? I guess that was 2000, right, around that this happened. And so, you know, there's some old school, you know, yeah. some vets in there, veteranos yeah. in that church, and yeah. just a lot of good people, you know, just real people. And they're all shaking my hand, and this and that, whatever, and I have the worst attitude, you know, and I sit in the seat, and I'm just, <laughs> you know, and this guy gets up, this little guy with this big old pulpit, talking about, you know, how the Lord came back with great glory and the leopards, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the leopards. I always thought, man, there was a lo- there's a lot of leopards in the, in the Bible, you know? I mean, I know they're, I thought they're in the desert. I didn't know they're in the jungle. Like, there's all these leopards, you know? But he was saying lepers, you know, leprosy. <laughs> leprosy, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, and so I'd sit there and I'd listen and I would get so mad because I felt like, dude, this guy is talking into my mind. Like, I'm saying something in my mind and then he says something and I'm like, no. Well, well, what about this? And I say something back in my mind, and then he'll just answer it. And I'll be like, whoa! Like, what about this? And I'll say something again, like for an hour, hour and a half, straight like that. And I'm like, so mad. Every Sunday and every Wednesday until the hearing, I was at that church. And finally, like the fourth time, we're on the way home. And I'm sitting in the back seat, just like sweating mad. That's how mad I am. And the family that's driving me, it's like this cute little church lady mom. And the dad's like all clean cut guy, you know. <laughs> and uh, the dad, I can see his eyes keep looking at me, you know, in the rear view mirror. And I know he's thinking, dude, this guy's about to go to the joint. Yeah. So like, what's he going to do in my car right now? He's yeah. all mad looking, you know. And he's driving and he's like, uh, 
is everything okay? <laughs> is everything good, Jake? And I was like, well, no, no, it's not okay. All right, I'm sick of this. Like, what? What did you tell him? What did you tell this guy about me? And like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, he said this, I thought this, and then he said this. And then he said this, I thought this, and then he said this. And it happened like this for the last, you know, three weeks, whatever. Why did, would you guys give him like cue cards or like whatever? Like he's making his Bible studies about me and they're laughing at me. It's like everyone here is right now. <laughs> and I was like, and when they started laughing at me, I started getting madder. And I was like, <gasps> like, what is this technology? Like, how does he know inside my brain or whatever? And then the little mom, she's like, what? it's the Holy Spirit. Like, <laughs> the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And I was just, I literally was like, no, oh, no. You know, I was so mad, you know. That was the beginning, you know. Oh, okay. So anyways, for I'm trying to wind it up quick, but. So for the next, like, literally six or eight weeks, every Sunday, every Wednesday, this phenomenon happened. And I never, like, was okay with it. I was furious the whole time. The, the court hearing happens. The lawyer that we hired paid a good amount of money. And he's like, oh, yeah, we'll take care of everything, blah, blah, blah. Dude, he's sweating. He looks totally nervous, all clammy. And I'm like, no, that's the wrong way to look. <laughs> that's the wrong way to look to represent my case right now, you know. <laughs> and uh, he doesn't say much to me. He goes up. They say a bunch of law stuff, blah, 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 blah. The judge hits the gavel. Boom, I got sentenced to six assault with a deadly weapon and two fleeing the scene of a crime. 66-year prison sentence. Boom. And I just hear my mom, I hear this shriek. Like, ah! like and She, like, fell on the ground be between the pews. My dad's, like, trying to pick her up. It's not like someone, like, stabbed her. She's bawling her eyes out. The bailiff's coming over to me. I'm looking at the lawyer. He's already slow... Like close his briefcase and walking out and I'm like do over like what happened just now yeah. and it was over and they come over they try to put the cuffs on me but my arms don't do that so they had to put like two sets of cuffs together to like put me over there you know and then I go and I sit next to all the people and these guys all corn roll gnarly you know tears and this that and here I am just sitting next to them well, I guess we're going to the same place these are guys that were in prison waiting for their court case you know whatever yeah. and so I'm sitting there Court's done, back door opens, whoosh, put your shoulder against the line, you know, keep your hands where you can see them, blah, 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 follow this line, boom, in. Like, this is it. And so that's how things were, you know, for the, actually for the next eight and a half months is, is that was the beginning of eight and a half months in Clark County Detention Center. So to try to wrap up what you asked me, like, how did everything change? No, no, this is all important, like... So this is good. my mom, with her little tea and crumpets, joyful life Bible study or whatever that she did, she's like, uh, <laughs> woohoo! Praise all the, all the Lord for those moms, moms and their joyful life. She, she, she told the ladies in her little circle what is going on with her son. And here's my little Japanese mom, you know, please pray for him. If the Lord puts something on your heart, you know, send him a, send him a letter or whatever. And so I didn't know she did this. I'm in there for like two months, and there's nothing to do. It's boring, obviously. My particular cell, you know, you have a little slot window with the little wire mesh thing so you can't shatter it out. Well, when my door shuts, dude, there's a giant column in between me and the clock. So when I go in the cell, it's like, I don't know if it's been five minutes or five hours or 12 hours or a day or a month. Miserable, bro. And my light, like above my bed, was just <laughs> like forever, all the time, for eight months. It was bad. It was not fun. My celly was like some weird dude, like messed up on crack. He had no teeth. It's like always stealing stuff out of my store. I didn't know if I was going to have to, like, shank him or something. Because I didn't want to let anyone find out that I'm letting this guy just steal out of my store because everyone's going to think I'm a punk. Yeah. And so, I, anyways, welcome to prison. So I was there for two months reading whatever, like all kinds of different books and stuff in the day room and this and that. And then all of a sudden, you know, 5 in the morning is breakfast. 5, 12, and 5 is what, how they do it over there. Mail call, you know, they read out my little prison number or whatever. Go get my mail. And here's this 
letter from someone I don't even know with the little like Avery Label Pro prison address that my mom handed out to all our little <laughs> tea and crumpets ladies, you know, with the Avery Label Pro. And so they just photocopied a sheet of the Bible and then like highlighted a couple verses, put it in the thing and sent it to me. And I got it in my hand. And so I get this letter, I'm like, hmm, whatever, cool. Go up to my cell and I'm reading it. And dude, the verse that's highlighted, it's just like when Raw was talking, like it was going into my brain at that moment. Like, what is this? Like, no, no, like here too? Like, how did they get me here? Like, how are they doing it? Like, is it like some Wi-Fi, like brain Wi-Fi? Like, what is this thing? Like, what is this technology that like they can see in my mind? And then another letter would come and the same thing happened. No, like, and then I have to wait for another letter. And so the letters would start coming. There a lot of different ladies in the group start sending me these letters. So ladies, be faithful. Send, send those mails to those uh, wayward sons. So finally, and it was like 10 times out of 10, every single time one of these little, you know, Avery Label Pro letters came in, it was the same phenomenon every time. So finally, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort this thing out right here. I'm gonna prove that someone's messing with me, that like, it's done, I'm, I'm finishing it today. So I got up from that letter and I knew there was this like holy roller guy out there and he liked to play chess. And so I was making these little origami chess boards and selling them to people for soups and stuff like that. I said, look, uh, I know you're getting transferred out of here pretty soon. Here's this sick chess set I made you, all perfect, everything, I'll trade you for your Bible. And so I got his Bible. And then I went back to the cell and I sat down and I was like, okay, God, like, whatever, like, do the letter thing. If you're real, do the letter thing. And so, like, I opened the Bible, I put my finger down, I start reading, and dude, it was the same. Like, I'm getting chills, like, telling you about it. It was the same. And I was like, no way, no way. And then I turn again, put my finger down, open my eyes, I read, feels like a contiguous conversation. No way, no way. Open again, put my finger down. <sighs> Again, put my finger down, and I literally, like, I don't remember how I got off the stool, but I went, like, I'm in the back of the cell, on the ground, on my butt, like, just, like, it's real, it's real. The, the felt board, the Noah's Ark, the two giraffes, the snake, Adam and Eve, like, the whole deal, like, all that stuff. And then I got back in the book and I just started reading more and more. And then it was like I was reading like this before. And then by the end, I was starting to read like this and like let the book start to talk to me. I didn't say, okay, Jesus, come into my heart. I didn't know all that vernacular, I guess. I just started reading the Bible and I just started eating the Bible all the time, every day for like five months straight, maybe six months straight. And then in the middle of the night, uh, one of the guards comes to the uh, cell and says, which one of you is Harmon? Right here. It's like, okay, roll him up. And I was like, oh, okay. And I just figured, you know, it had been eight months, eight and a half months. The prisons are so crowded over there. It takes about eight to nine months for a person to process from the county to the, to the, the joint, the pen. And so I just figured, all right, I'm getting ready to go out on a bus and go out to like Blythe or wherever they send Vegas criminal people. And so that's what I thought was happening. Rolled up my bedding, got all my letters together and my Bible and all this little stuff and go with the guard. Goes to the first place, unlocks it, takes me to the first place, drop off all the bedding. They give me this bag with like all my personal clothes. I said, change out of that jumper, put your personal clothes back on, okay. And so I'm just going through this processing. The next cell I get to this cell, it's like they give me back all the letters that didn't make it to me. They give me back like a book that someone mailed to me. My friend, <laughs> stupid friend, Dan Salas, if you're here. Uh, man, he- Call him out. Yeah, he, no, he's my best friend. He's my, he's my best friend in the whole world. He sent me a get out of jail free card. <laughs> Mon <laughs> Monopoly get out of jail free card. So good. 
<laughs> Dude, only he could do that. Cause, yeah. And I was in there or else I'd have punched him in the mouth for that one. I was so mad. <laughs> but anyways, that thing came back to me and all this stuff. And I was just like, wow, weird. And then the next cell, they like, give me back my keys and wallet and all this personal stuff. And I'm like, this is, something's weird. So then the next place they go, they like fingerprint me, like take my picture and this and that. And they're like, all right. So, and then I'm like, okay, well, what do I do? He's like, well, I don't know, but don't come back here. And I'm like, okay, so where do I go now? <laughs> like, I was like, something's wrong, like an error, you know? Yeah, yeah. So where do I go now? He's like, well, just follow that line and go out that way. And then after the first set of doors, you're going to make a right. And then after that is the lobby. And then after the lobby is the this and that. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> And I like get my stuff and I'm like, oh dude, they've made a mistake. <laughs> but I'm gonna cash in on this mistake. If I'm gonna be out, like it's their job. Like let them find me. You know, they made a mistake. And so like I'm just like, okay, All right, there's a camera right there, smile, everything is good. Okay, walk along, da-da-da. Made it through the first doors. I like wanna sprint. I'm like sweating, yeah, no. but I'm like, I'm cool. Nothing's wrong. Everything's normal. This is normal. Just walking right out of prison. No problem. <laughs> and then another doors come and like, all right, there's people like in plain clothes, like grandmas yelling at little kids and all this in the lobby. And I'm like, oh, wow. All right. One more set of doors. And then I go out. Boom. Clear night, cold air. No, bzzz, you know, just like air still cars, phone booth, Greyhound, bus center, like, what to do, you know? I've got $11 in my pocket, what am I gonna do? And as I'm sitting there thinking about how I'm gonna run far on $11, this car pulls up, honks, it's a buddy of mine who's stationed out at Nellis Air Force Base. He's like, get in the car, I'm like, Mike, what is going on? Are you gonna get in trouble? Is it, what's going on? He's like, no, everything's okay, I'll explain it to you, and so, I guess that lawyer guy or whatever, a bunch of more letters got written. He submitted those to the judge. Um, and these were pretty, I guess, big time letters from like the dean of Arizona State University, the president of athletics, all these. It was awesome. These people really like wrote nice letters on my behalf. The judge looked at them, read them all, and said, okay, this was too heavy of a sentence to put on this kid or whatever. So she like relented the sentence. So I was released to my, on my own recognizance into my parents' care and transferred over to California where I was on parole for seven years until the parole finished. And then that was that. Oh, yeah, praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand. <clears throat> so, like, as I'm home, I was home for a little bit, uh, the, one of the coaches... Uh, my junior college coach, he like blew out his knee. I didn't know this, and he didn't tell me this. But he was also one of the guys. He was actually a prison guard before, and so he knew how the whole thing worked. He was faithfully putting money on my books every week in prison. And um, when I got out, I found out that he blew out his knee. He, he needed to help. He needed a, a coach to help. I obviously can't work anywhere. And I just, you know, I said, well, I'll help as much as I can. And so I, I was helping there. A couple kids that had graduated from Calvary Chapel High School in wrestling went to Cerritos, and they end up telling Coach John Azevedo that I'm back in California, I'm back in town, blah, blah, blah. And then Coach called me, and then I told him what had happened and everything. And then I just remember the first, like, part of the conversation. I was like, John, John, guess what? John, I love Jesus. John, I love Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus, John. John, I love Jesus. It worked. It worked. You prayed. It worked. And he, all I heard was him just bawling on the other side of the line because the whole time that I was here, I was such a mess up. But he was always just loving on me, loving on me. Never pushy, never, you know, trying to shove Christianity down my throat, but just faithfully and patiently loving on me and demonstrating Christ to me. And so I had to let him know. Like, that it worked. <laughs> it works. Yeah. It works. And so. How, how's, your, uh, how's your life different now that you found God? What, like, the difference, obviously, you're not going out and going nuts, but 
even people here that don't believe in, in God, yeah. or maybe they're going, well, it, maybe, there's a lot of people you know, in the world that's kind of watching. If you don't have Jesus, if you don't yeah. have God in your life, you're trying, searching to find something that will fill that void. Yeah. Because we're all born with that empty void Absolutely. in our lives. Absolutely. And when you do give your life to mm -hmm. God, Jesus Christ, yeah. not all the other religions, because all that stuff is just, religion is man reaching up to God. Yeah. That's all the religions of the world. But then a Christian, a Christian having a relationship with Jesus is God reaching down to man. That's mm -hmm. why he sent the son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. And we've been to Israel. Mm -hmm. He's not, he died on the cross, he's raised from the dead, the tomb's yeah. empty, the whole, all the deals, that, that's all there. Yeah. But speak into people that are here that are actually looking for something they're missing at. How, it, how is it real? How truly, what's the difference? Man, gosh, how do you say this, like in a nutshell? Like, it's weird because everything's different, but everything's the same. It's just a different means to the end, I guess you can say. Like, it's not like, oh, it's all bunnies and rainbows and everyone's happy and lollipops. And yeah. it's not that, man. No. Life is tough. Life is difficult. You still have sin. You still have flesh. You still have urges. You have your old life and things that you used to do. Then you're just like, uh, and you're like jonesing to do this thing or that thing or whatever. The difference now is instead of pursuing those things, and just touching the fire all the time and getting burned and hurting and then getting and then trying to medicate the hurt that you just inflicted on yourself with drugs, drinking or promiscuity or whatever. Instead of doing that, now it's like, okay, no, Lord, pause. Like, Jesus, I need your help. Lord, help my mind right now. Help, help my thoughts to be stayed upon you. Lord, I know that nothing in this world, uh, nothing happens without your allowance or your providence. So therefore, everything that happens, good or bad, I recognize as from the hand of God, and it's to teach me and to sculpt me and to sculpt my relationship with him, to dig deeper into his word, to dig deeper into my prayer closet and just get ferocious on my face in prayer over whatever situation or whatever. Like to sum it up in a word, hope. I have hope. Um, I have the hope of heaven. I have hope in a real savior that really saves. I have hope in like, well, I'm evidence. He, he's repaired my life. My life was uh, just a worm eaten hollow mess. And now my life is rich and full and I have, you know, an amazing, I have an amazing, beautiful life that God handed back to me, given me all of the desires of my heart, all of the dreams and things that I always tried so hard to make happen with my own strength. Now they effortlessly happen because they're just rolling out of God's hand to me. And I want to add to that because that's something like, because even there might be, even be people here, because I have friends that are super rich and not into drugs or alcohol or anything like that yeah, yeah. but they they're like empty and yeah. miserable and when you're when you give your life to god and if you are one of those people that yeah man i'm not a murderer i'm not a fighter i'm not into drugs and all that stuff you know i'm just a normal person um those when you find god it's like number one you get your name written in the book of life so now when you do take your last breath you go to heaven so it's eternity. You're talking, it's an eternal thing. It's what we're talking about is eternity because we are created for eternity because we're mind, body, spirit. Mm -hmm. And the, the spirit is, is what's created for eternity. But when we give our lives to Christ, like you were saying, everything that you do now is effortless because God's rolling out that plan. When you invite Christ into your life, it's like you come to him. And I've used this example before, but you're your life is like that puzzle, all messed up. It's like 2,000 pieces mm -hmm. in a box. Mm -hmm. You dump it out in front of God, whether you're a drug addict or whether you're not a drug addict and you're a rich person that has it all together, but you're feeling empty, mm -hmm. that void. You dump out in front of God and God starts putting that, those pieces back together and he starts give it, giving you those desires of your heart. Mm -hmm. From my background, being in the skateboard industry and working in the, in the rock and roll mm -hmm. industry is everything I fought for. I did it all. Like I, I got there, I did everything. I wanted to, I had it all, but I was empty. But when I gave my life to God, it's like he gave that all back to me, mm -hmm. like you're wrestling and everything, mm -hmm. but like a hundred times more. Yes. But it just comes to that point where you just got to surrender yes. and be like, God, if you're real, like when you were like, okay, dude, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I'm going to read this Bible and see if this thing happens. Like yeah. You got to come aggressively to God. Like, <laughs> yeah. dude, 
prove you're real. Yeah. And that's what I did in that hotel room when I was in Panama. God, if you're real and you exist, prove that you're real to me. Yeah. And he does. Yeah. But it takes us stepping out by faith and going, do you exist? And if you exist, reveal yourself. Yeah. And he just starts unfolding that life. And he says, I've come to give peace yeah. and rest. He says, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. I've come to give you peace yes. and rest for your soul. My wife, she used to go to bed at night, and she had an amazing career. But she was actually one of those ones that wasn't into drugs and all that stuff, but she made tons of money and had a